Welcome back to the last lecture this afternoon. Our next speaker, Dr. Robert Plowman, is recognized as an outstanding investigator and theorist in behavior genetics. He has been amazingly prolific in the number of articles, papers, and books he has authored, and there is universal agreement among his peers that his work has been both groundbreaking and innovative. Dr. Plowman became interested in behavior genetics while taking it as a required course when he was a graduate student in psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. He quickly realized the importance of bringing together both genetic and environmental research strategies in the study of human development in a field that had been largely dominated by environmentalism, the legacy of the American behaviorists. His position after receiving his PhD was at the Institute of Behavioral Genetics at the University of Colorado at Boulder, the only one of its kind at the time. Dr. Plowman and his colleague John DeFries began uh, work on what has become uh, known as the Colorado Adoption Project. It involves tracking more than 2,400 adopted children from infancy to adulthood, a group key in determining the culture and biological influences in development. This project has been remarkably productive with over 150 publications since its inception. In 1986, Dr. Plowman moved to Penn State where he and Gerald McLaren launched a study of elderly twins reared apart and twins reared together and developed mouse models to identify genes in complex behavioral systems. In 1994, he moved to the Institute of Psychiatry in London, where he and Professor Sir Michael Rudder set up the Social, Genetic, and Developmental Psychiatry Research Center, where he is currently Deputy Director and undertaking new research that involves the study of all twins born in England between 1994 and 1996. Recently, he has turned his attention towards the study of molecular, molecular genetics to identify genes for psychological traits. His research has always emphasized that individuals are not passive recipients of environmental influence, but individuals that select, modify, and create environments in accordance with inherited predispositions, what has been called the nature of nurture, and the title we chose for our conference. He has been a paradigm-changing influence for psychology, and he has helped to create a new understanding and a more balanced view of the influences of nature and nurture in human development. Please join in welcoming Dr. Robert Plowman. Well, thank you, Dick, very much. That was a very nice introduction. And that introduction plus the first article in the brochure that you received today by Tim Robinson pretty much says it all. So if you don't get what I say now, all you have to do is read that and you're in business. And I'd also like to uh, thank President Dennis Johnson for his speech this morning. Um, you remember about his grandchildren. And I think it's great to be in an area where the basic science that you're studying, issues of genetics and environment as they affect behavioral development, the, the, those basic science questions are applied science issues to people like President Johnson with his grandchildren and your children and even yourselves. Part of understanding yourself is understanding the situ issue of nature and nurture. When, you, when I say the word nature, what do you think about? You know, people often think about very warm, fuzzy things like how beautiful it is outside today and the leaves are changing and all of that. And also with the word nurture, nurture also um, connotes warm, fuzzy things like mothers and babies. But when you put those two words together, you have... <laughs> people have shown, if you say nature, nurture, undergraduate psychology students say controversy. And it's only that way because people think about it as nature versus nurture. And really the theme of my talk today is that the nature-nurture wars are over. Almost everyone recognizes that both nature and nurture are important in behavioral development. Now that may be a truism, but it's actually a deeper thought than that. It's not just saying, oh well, genes and environment are both important, so can't we all be friends? It's really the science of it says that genes are important and environment is important. And furthermore, and the main thing I really want to get across, is that we understand a lot more about behavioral development if we bring these genetic and environmental strategies together. So, um, I'm always curious what people think. You know, in the media, um, it's often assumed that uh, 
people are environmentalists and behavioral geneticists like me are the bad guys that are disillusioning them of their environmental beliefs of the blank slate and that everything you do to your children as a parent it has to do, everything that happens to them is about the environmental treatment that you give them. But I don't think, I think uh, the man on the street's smarter than that. So I do wonder, um, of individual differences in height, now I assume most people accept that that's largely due to genetics. As uh, Jerry Kagan was just saying, we're just talking about what happens on average. And certainly, if you starve a child, put them in the dark closet that Jerry Kagan was talking about, even a child that would have been very tall could be quite stunted in growth. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the normal range of genetic and environmental variation in this room. And is there anyone who doesn't believe that genetics mostly account for um, individual differences in height? Okay, so. I'm not going to talk about that because I think everyone does accept that height is almost entirely due to genetic factors, to inherited differences among us. Again, as uh, Eric Kandel and Jerry were talking about, we're not talking about our species and why we are about five foot six or seven on average as compared to chimpanzees who are smaller or gorillas who are larger or rhesus monkeys who are much smaller. We're saying in our what causes these individual differences in height, and you all agree that genetics plays the largest role. I thought I'd talk instead about weight. I'd use that as an example of some of these points. Because just think about it now. Nature, nurture, what do you think? Is it, do you think it's largely due to environmental factors, or is there a, gen, is, is there a genetic component to weight? Yeah. Well, just remember what you think and see how you think about it after I tell you about it. And I'll, so I'll use weight as an example of these sorts of designs that ask, allow us to say empirically how much is genetics important and how much is environment important. And then we'll talk about the behavioral things that maybe interest you more. I'd also just briefly like to mention common medical disorders. What do you think? Nature, nurture, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, ulcers. Don't, you don't have to tell me. Just kind of get it in your head as to what you think. And then what about once you get into behavior, people think, oh, well, that's so e e ephemeral and hard to measure. How could there be much genetic influence there? And then finally, what about normal traits, not just disorders? What about normal variation like personality? Is there genetic influence or not? So I'll be talking about those issues, beginning with weight. And along the way, I'd like to mention eight misunderstandings about nature and nurture and how they fit together. The very first one, I thought I could get into when he was talking about his tapestry and that, but because there are many um, metaphors that people use to try to make this point that you can't separate the effects of nature and nurture because both nature and nurture are essential. I mean, how can you have behavior if you don't have genes and you don't have environment? Therefore, isn't it nonsense to talk about the relative influence of genes and environment? Well, that's true. Here's one of the metaphors. The area of a tangle is a product of its length and width. So isn't it stupid to say how much of the area of that rectangle is due to length and how much of it's due to width? There, there is no area unless there's length and width. But when you think about genes and environment, that's exactly the mistake people are making. And here's the point. Jerry also emphasized this point. That we're not talking about one rectangle we're not, or, or an average rectangle. We're talking about individual differences, differences between individuals in our species and the extent to which genetic and environmental factors are important. So in terms of areas of rectangles, those areas, you can actually say how much of the area differences are due to length and how much of the differences are due to weight. Moreover, um, the differences, well, sorry, I'm having trouble moving this here, here we go. The differences can be called the width can be the same for everybody. You can hold the width constant, and the area of the rectangles will differ as a function of length. Similarly, you can hold um, 
the length constant and the differences in area will be solely due to width. Okay, but that's, this is all because we're talking about not one rectangle, but many rectangles. So if you think about weight, people vary in weight from the boy on the left who's very thin to the boy on the right who's thin in between. So what causes those differences in weight? The second misunderstanding, let's use weight as an example, is people will say, how can genetics be important? Because everybody knows if you don't eat, you lose weight. It's obvious, isn't it? So how can genetics be important? Well, the answer is that genetics is talking about what is. It's saying of the individual differences in this room in weight, to what extent are genetic and environmental for those differences. Some of you are on diets, and uh, there's lots of environmental differences among you. But given those differences that normally occur, to what extent would this snapshot in this room and weight measurements be due to genetic differences? So behavioral genetics isn't about what could be. It's absolutely true. If you don't eat, you will lose weight. But those of us who diet and try to lose weight, we sometimes gain our weight back again. But at any point now, let's take the weight of everybody that's important and how much is environment. So the fact that if you don't eat, you lose weight doesn't matter. Behavioral genetics is talking about what is, not what could be. And it's certainly not talking about what should be. I'll talk about that later. A third misunderstanding is that how can genetics be important because there's an epidemic of weight in most um, advanced cultures in the world. Um, and America, as in many things, is leading the epidemic of weight. Well, those changes have happened too rapidly to be due to genetic factors. So environment must be important in that trend. But that doesn't mean genetics is not important. The trait we know most about is height, and you know height has been increasing generation by generation for 50 years. Well, um, the, the heritability, the genetic influence on individual differences in height has not changed. So even though the average height of generation by generation, their resemblance to their parents is just the same. It hasn't been changing. And that makes the larger point, the second point, that's also a contentious issue about race differences, class differences, gender differences, or cohort differences, that the causes of average differences between groups are not necessarily related to the causes of individual differences within groups. So the average the reason why, on average, our population increases in weight, but that has nothing to do with the question of whether individual differences within each of those cohorts is due to genetic or environmental influences. So how do we know? The point of these studies is you can't just assume what's heritable. You have to use these techniques to assess it, because I'll show you examples where your intuitions as to what ought to be heritable are wrong. The two major methods that are used are the twin study, where we compare identical adoption study, where we compare non-adoptive and adoptive relatives. So I'll tell you about both of those methods briefly. Identical twins, sometimes called monozygotic, meaning one zygote, a single egg that's fertilized with one sperm, and then early in development, in the first few days of life typically, that that fertilized egg splits and becomes two individuals with the same DNA in each of those zygotes. They're actually, you know, people worry about identical twins are more clones than clones because they're clones that grow up in the same womb and they're the same age throughout life. Whereas if, if you were cloned, your clone then would be placed in some womb and it would grow up in a different womb but also in a different cohort from you. And there are cohort effects. So identical twins are more clones than clones. And I, about 1% one, about, uh, of all births are twins. Identical twins. Two-thirds are what we call fraternal twins or dizygotic twins. These are two separately fertilized eggs. So these are just two eggs that are 
happen to be fertilized at the same time. So they're like any brother and sister in that they share 50% of their genes. They're 50% similar genetically. So the twin method consists of comparing the resemblance of identical twins to the resemblance of fraternal twins for many, many pairs. You can't do this for one pair. You can't say, here's one pair of there can't be any genetic influence. What we're talking about are differences in the population on average and the extent to which genetic and environmental differences account for those differences that we observe. So if genetics is important, you'd have to predict that identical twins will be more similar than fraternal twins. Oops, I hope that isn't a terrible problem. Are you here? Okay. Okay. Very good. Did it overheat? This is hot stuff. Okay, so the twin method is one way of answering the question empirically about genetic and environmental influence. So I'll use weight as an example. Um, what if weight were entirely due to nurture? If you understood what I just said, you'd realize that identical twins are weight. Because the twofold greater genetic similarity of identical twins shouldn't matter if genes aren't important. You follow that? So identical twins and fraternal twins ought to be just as similar. Now what if it's entirely due to nature, genetics? Then you'd expect identical twins to be about twice as similar as fraternal twins. And if it, all the individual differences in weight are due to genetics, you'd expect identical twins to be 100% similar genetically. Because they're 100% similar genetically. That correlation, does every, if you don't know what a correlation is, it's an index that goes from zero to one. Zero means no resemblance at all. One means perfect resemblance, identical. The other design, that's the twin design, the adoption design is more powerful in some ways because it, it almost experimentally separates genetic and environmental influence. Parents and their offspring share genes as well as environment. So when we say that things because of genes or because of environment, the adoption method separates that by looking for genetic relatives who only share genes but not environment and environmental relatives who share environment but not genes. And this is a social experiment that's happened you know, since the 1930s here, where adoption agencies exist so that um, unwed mothers relinquish babies for adoption at birth, and those babies are adopted, are just as genetically related to their birth parents, their biological parents, as any kid is to its parents. And then it's as related environmentally to these adoptive parents. And that's also true for siblings. A third of adoptive families adopt a second child. Those two children are genetically unrelated to one another, but they share the same home. In addition, there are biological unwed mothers um, who, who relinquish more than one child for adoption. That they're genetically related to one another, even though they're reared in different homes. So the adoption method neatly cleaves separates the genetic and environmental influence that's normally confounded in a family study. So with an adoption design, what if weight is entirely due to nurture? All that matters is whether you grew up with somebody, you shared the same environment. So we'd expect adoptive relatives on the right to be just as similar as non-adoptive. Whereas if you were adopted apart from your relative, like your parent, um, you don't share that family environment, therefore you shouldn't be similar in weight if what's important is nurture. But what about nature? You'd expect a very different pattern of results. What's important is whether you share genes, not whether you share environment. So if genetics entirely accounts for weight, you would expect these adopted apart relatives to be just as similar for weight as non-adoptive relatives who share genes and environment. And you'd expect adoptive relatives not to be at all similar because they don't share genes.
So, what are the results? For twins, here are the results over many studies. Identi uh, fraternal twins are about half as similar as identical twins, suggesting substantial genetic influence on individual differences in weight. But is it all genetic? No, because similar for weight, they're about 80% similar. So the differences within identical twins has to be explained environmentally because they're genetically identical to one another. Well, those are the twin results suggesting substantial genetic influence, but also providing evidence for non-genetic, environmental influence. I did want to point out that identical twins are amazingly concordant for obesity as well as weight. Identical twins reared apart. That's what people often think about when they think about twins. Oh, identical twins reared apart. Well, there's only a few hundred pairs who have been studied in all the world because it's obviously a very rare uh, occurrence. But there's considerable data on identical twins reared apart for weight, and as you can see, they're almost as similar as identical twins reared together. So these are the data I showed you before, and here are the data for identical twins reared apart, showing that together. The other adoption results can, are much larger studies, and parents and offspring correlate about 0.25 for weight. Now that could be either genetic or environmental, but what the adoption method does is it disentangles that by studying genetically related individuals reared apart, parents who adopt their children away at birth. And as you can see, those children, even 20 years later, are just about as similar to their birth parents as our kids. And even more surprisingly is that adoptive parents who adopt these children very early in life and give them the nutrition and the living styles that we often think are associated with weight, those kids aren't at all similar to their adoptive parents in weight. So when you put these data, the uh, same thing's true of siblings. Adoptive siblings who grow up in the same family but don't share genes aren't at all similar for weight. correlate about 0.3 something, 0.33, um, a bit more than parents and offspring. So when you put these data together, here's the sort of picture you get, where the pie represents the differences in weight in a population, in the populations we've studied, which are Caucasian, mostly North American and European populations. And you find that genetic factors account for about, say, two-thirds of the variance. But these data also provide the best evidence that we have for the importance of environmental factors because even in the case of weight, which is much more highly heritable than most of the behaviors I'll show you, even in the case of weight, about a third of the variance is due to environmental factors. And later on, I'll emphasize this distinction between shared environment and non-shared environment. But the point I'm trying to make here is that weight accounts for maybe about two thirds of the variance in weight. Is that what people thought? I think there's a lot of no's there. So I hope I convinced you that genetics is important, but I want to say right away that just because genetics is important, it doesn't mean there's nothing you can do about it. As we said before, if you don't eat, you do lose weight. When you find genetic influence, it really is just influence. It doesn't mean that genes determine anything. So risk factors. It means that if, if you come from a family where there's a lot of obesity, you're probably at, well, you are very likely at increased genetic risk for becoming um, obese. And that means if you eat the same sorts of things that everybody else does, your friends might not become obese, but you're at greater risk for that. And it, it doesn't mean it's bad, by the way. I mean, the general thinking about it evolutionarily is age in which we evolved, where it was very important to be able to store fat efficiently. But our problem in society is having these Stone Age genes in a modern society with fast food restaurants everywhere you turn. <laughs>
And so in, in a larger sense, I think um, it's important to recognize that genes aren't destiny, but it, it's part of understanding who we are and who our children are, knowing that genes are important for some of these traits, even like weight. much due to genetics, but it is. Another misunderstanding is if genetics is important, there cannot be equality. This, now, this doesn't sound, people aren't too uptight about it in terms of weight. If I had been talking about personality or intelligence, people might have gotten a bit more worried on this score. But I think it's good to bring it up in terms of weight. I mean, are we going to discriminate against people because there's genetic influence on weight? Well, of course not. I think there might actually be more understanding of it if we think It's not just a matter of lacking self-control. Some people find it tremendously more difficult um, not to gain weight than other people for genetic reasons. But in the larger sense, when our forefathers say, said that all men were created equal, they, they weren't so naive as to think that all people are identical. I mean, they had eyes. They could tell people differ in weight and height, and they probably knew they differ in terms of depression and intelligence. Equality, of oppor uh, uh, equality before the law was the fundamental thing that they were after. And the recognition that if everybody were identical, you wouldn't need a democracy because there wouldn't be any differences. But it, it's really um, that the essence of democracy is that um, you treat people equally before the law despite their differences. There was a lot to say about this, like um, equality of opportunity. Now that's a trickier one, but maybe we can get into is that you're only studying genetics because you're trying to push a, a conservative political agenda. And that really is very wrong, and it's also um, uh, obnoxious, really, in a way. It's to impute political motives for um, the science of it. Um, I come from an old-fashioned point of view where I don't believe science is politics. I think what we're trying to do is, as dispassionately as possible, examine the evidence for important issues in our Society, and that there isn't a necessary connection between research and uh, policies, that policies depend on values as well as information. And one can only hope that you make better decisions with information than without information. But most of the time, I think people are quite willing to make policy decisions with no information at all. But you know, when you're planning obesity intervention, you're going to go seriously wrong in terms of making an impact on this very important problem of our society. A lot of these issues that I've just discussed are um, presented brilliantly in a book that just came out last month by Steve Pinker called The Blank Slate. Um, he examines historically the, the reasons why we've been so reluctant to accept a more balanced view of nature and nurture. strongly recommend it. Now, I'm going to just take a, a, about three minutes here, five minutes to tell the truth, to digress a bit because uh, I'm, most of what I do now is molecular genetics, but I decided in my talk today not to talk about molecular genetics because it doesn't fit the theme of the conference quite as well. When you study genes themselves, um, it's great to identify specific genes responsible for this. because of the evidence for the strong genetic influence on it. Um, but it, it doesn't in itself, molecular genetics, tell you anything about nurture. We can, once we identify genes, they'll help us a lot in understanding the developmental interface with nurture. But right now, all the work is in terms of trying to find genes. But I couldn't help but say a, a few things about it. One of the first When I talk to journalists, I usually end up by saying, okay, we're talking about genetic influence on some language problem of kids, which is one of the things I study now. Invariably, the headline comes out, 
the gene for language. And you try and say, you know, it's exactly what you don't want to say because for complex traits of the sort we're talking about here, like obesity or common medical disorders or depression, hyperactivity, anxiety, they're influenced by many genes. And that has some important implications. It means that the the, uh, the trait isn't determined. If you have a single gene, like if you have the gene for Huntington's disease, you'll die from it. It doesn't matter what your other genes are. It doesn't matter what your, other, your environment is. It's hardwired deterministic. And the problem is that when people think about behavioral disorders, they, they think that same way. And as a result, Involved. And as a result of that complexity, these genetic effects are only influences. They're those propensities or risk factors. They don't determine our behavior. From a molecular genetic point of view, this last point is very important. It's been very difficult finding genes for these complex traits because, I think, there are many genes involved. So any one gene has a small effect, which means it's much more difficult. from a single gene perspective. You undoubtedly, when you first read about genetics, were reading about Mendel. Mendel was studying seven single gene characteristics. So if you get this form of one gene, you will have wrinkled seeds. It, they're necessary and sufficient. That is, those pea plants would only have wrinkled seeds if they've got that form of the gene, and you don't find these um, highly deterministic and hardwired. Well, when we're talking about complex traits, we're not talking about either or things. You're not either obese or not, or depressed or not, or alcoholic or not. We're talking about continuously distributed characteristics. You don't wake up one day alcoholic. It's a very long progression and there are many people in the borderline area. Well, from a genetic point of view, different from the, a distribution, that most distributions, uh, that is most common disorders, are probably the extreme of continuous distributions. So from a genetic point of view, what that means is, this is a slide showing a red-green, a gene, and a yellow gene. And what it's saying is, both of those genes are associated with higher values on this trait. Let's call it weight. So. are necessary or sufficient. There are some people up here who are very heavy who don't have either gene, and um, there's lots of people of middle weight who have one gene or the other. If there are many genes involved, um, they're going to contribute quantitatively to the trait. So from a molecular genetic point of view, it has a, a, a very different approach. We're not just going to look for families where they have the disorder, because it's not a matter of is that there may be no common disorders. From a genetic point of view, common disorders may be merely the quantitative extreme of the same genetic and environmental factors that operate throughout the distribution. And people like that in a way because you're thinking about obesity now, not as something out there that other people have, but it's part of the same ideological continuum that we're all on. So that's one important issue in terms of um, molecular genetics. The largest issue is that it's been taking, it's been much harder to find genes. We can find genes for um, rare, severe disorders, but for the common disorders, which are the vast number of the things that um, hurt us in life, it's, there's no evidence that these are single gene characteristics. There are many genes involved. But what we don't know is some genes that maybe account for 5 or 10 percent of the differences. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. This seems closer to the truth, that for complex disorders, there are probably many genes involved, each of which have very small effects.
And the implication of that is that it's going to be very difficult to find those genes. So that's where we are on the molecular genetic side. I have no doubt that we will find many of those genes. In the single genes. But when we find those genes, then the fun will begin because we'll begin to understand how those genes work. Finding the genes is only the first step. And what the next decades are going to be about is understanding how those genes work. Not just at the molecular level that Eric Kandel talked about this morning. That's what most people are doing. If you've got a gene, you try to understand its product in a cell and what goes on in What's very exciting about functional genomics, that is, how do genes work, is to think about a different level of analysis, the behavioral level of analysis, and to study how genes work at the level of the behavior of the whole organism, how the gene um, affects an organism during development, when does it affect it, early or late, and then how does it affect the organism's interaction genomics. The important point here is that understanding how genes work isn't just at a molecular biology level, but it can also be at a behavioral level. And as someone else said earlier, what's most exciting about all of this is that DNA will help to integrate the behavioral sciences into the life sciences as these bottom-up approaches meet the top-down approaches in the brain. Okay, so that's my little and return to this pi diagram of weight. I was focused on this two-thirds of the pi that's due to genetic differences. I'm now going to focus on this other third that um, talks about environmental influences. And the first point, misunderstanding I want to make about this, is that when you say genetic influence is important, it doesn't mean the environment is not important. And which is what I'll be talking about now, and that genetics provides new ways of thinking about how the environment works. And the first topic I'll talk about is non-shared environment. I think two of the most important findings about the environment has come from genetic research. And the first one is this topic of non-shared environment. If, if you think about weight, for example, what are our theories of the type of food you learn to eat, and the lifestyle, how sedentary, for example, the lifestyle was of your family. But two kids growing up in the same family should have experienced that same environment then, if that's so important. These are called shared environmental influences. They make family members similar. Well, one way to estimate them directly is by looking at adoptive relatives. Adopt What we showed before, we're not looking at the genetics now, we're looking at what these data tell us about the environment. And they say that parents and offspring who grow, you know, where the children grow up in that family don't resemble each other at all for weight. Similarly, for adoptive siblings, their correlation for weight is about zero. So these are kids growing up in the same family, and yet they're not at all. that shared environmental influences can't be important, that what's important largely is the environment, but it's a different type of environment. It's called non-shared. Whatever it is, it's making children in the same family different from one another. One way of estimating it is to ask about the difference for, between identical twins. If identical twins differ, it can't be due to genetics. It has to be environmental. And if they grow up in Twenty percent of those differences are due to non-shared environment. So that's why we showed, when you look at all the literature on weight, that about a third of the variance is due to environmental factors, but most of that 
is due to non-shared environment, and not much is due to shared environment. And in fact, the shared environmental factor is probably an postnatally than are other siblings, so that most of that estimate is due to the twin studies. If you take twin studies out, as in those adoption studies, all of the environmental influences seem to be due to non-shared environment. So the first point I want to make is that by saying non-shared environment is important, it doesn't mean that parents don't have an effect. It does mean that the effects of parents Ask why children in the same family are so different in weight. Why is it that the environment, whatever it is, is making two kids in a family different, not similar, in terms of weight? And the answer to this is going to, be, to come from research that looks at more than one child per family. So that's the topic of non-shared environment. And um, what I want to do now... environment is mostly due to non-shared environment, I'd like to now quickly go on and talk about the results for these other areas because, as you'll see, the results are somewhat similar in making those, those points. So in terms of medical disorders, these are twin results um, for the major common medical disorders, like, in case you can't read it, breast cancer, heart disease, ulcers. And these are MZ, monozygotic. Um, the point I want to make with this is you have to use these twin studies to assess rather than assume genetic influence. Because if I had asked you, what about ulcers? Is there genetic influence there? How about ulcers compared to heart disease compared to breast cancer? Where is there more genetic influence? I know what you would have said because I've done this. Ulcers people think are due to stress, therefore there's not much genetic influence. But in contrast, ulcers are actually one of the Well, you might say, how can this be? I mean, ear infections has to do with whether you get an infection. No, it doesn't. It has mostly to do with your susceptibility, your vulnerability to ear infections, and that has a strong genetic component. Similarly with ulcers. Yeah, they have to do with stress, but we all experience stress. Whether we get ulcers or not is, to some extent, due to genetic differences among us. Well, the, on the other side of the BRCA1 and 2 that cause breast cancer. But those are single gene types of cancer that are very rare, very severe, and they appear very early. Identical twin concordances for breast cancer among female identical twins, where one, at least one has breast cancer, are about 15%. That means 85% of the time when one identical twin gets But because of all the interest in molecular genetics, nobody's really paying attention to this and saying the vast majority of the reason why one woman gets breast cancer and the other doesn't is not genetic. There's no way you can argue with identical twin concordances that are so low, lower than you find for just about any medical disorders. Most of the reason, most of are things like hypertension and heart disease, where they show modest genetic influence. Now, if you keep the differences in mind here, look at the average difference between the blue and the yellow. And now I'm going to show you the common uh, behavioral disorders, mental illnesses. The first thing you notice is that there's greater differences between identical and fraternal twin concordances. There's more genetic influence on common mental illnesses. Biological, therefore they must be more genetic. But again, you can't assess, you can't assume what's heritable. You have to study it. And for whatever reason, behavioral disorders are more heritable. I think it's because behavior is farther downstream and there's more opportunity for many different genetic systems, 
brain physiology to enter into that down. Again, along the lines of assessing rather than assuming, a good example is autism. Um, uh, Professor Michael, who was a uh, writer, who was mentioned um, as the person who co-founded this new center in London with me, was studying autism. He was a socialization researcher. He really thought that most of the important factors in mental illness are environment, and especially early environment. You'd expect, if you did a twin study of autism, you'd expect fraternal twins to be just as similar as identical twins. But in contrast, after he did the research, he found that identical twins are amazingly highly concordant, about 60% concordant for autism, as compared to fraternal twins who are much less concordant. There have been three subsequent studies, all of which found the same result. one of the most highly heritable mental disorders and as a result there are now international consortia trying to identify specific genes responsible for autism. But the concordance for identical twins isn't a hundred percent. The news ten years ago was the concordance for autism for identical twins is sixty percent. identical twins for autism is only 60 percent. Forty percent of the time autistic identical twins where one is autistic the other is not. They're discordant. There can't be any genetic explanation for that. It has to be environmental. So even in the case of autism these data provide the best evidence we have for the importance of environmental influence and that those influences are always been assumed to be highly heritable, but actually it's quite modestly heritable compared to other behavioral disorders. So what it, is it just disorders? A lot of people think that we're all the same genetically except for a few rogue mutations that make us different. But if you look at normal dimensions of behavior, you find the same than fraternal twins, suggesting genetic influence on personality traits like neuroticism and extroversion, on cognitive traits like um, spatial reasoning or verbal reasoning. Jerry Kagan was talking about vocabulary. Memory always shows less genetic influence than other traits. Those of you getting older and having senior moments will be pleased to know. And general intelligence also has one of the telling us that genetics is important, but the environment is also important, and that the environment largely works in a non-shared way. So in summarizing those data, um, and the, um, genetics is important for nearly all these complex traits, a bit more for some, like say ulcers, and a bit less for others, say breast cancer. at the same time is that these data provide the best evidence we have for the importance of the environment, but that environment works in a way that most of us hadn't expected. That is, whatever it's doing, it's making two children growing up in the same family different from one another rather than similar. So when I said there were two findings from genetics about the environment that I think are the most important findings, of nurture. And that's the notion that there's a correlation between our genetic propensities and the experiences that we have. In technical terms, it's called genotype environment correlation. And what it's about is genetic influence on exposure to environment. So here's that mother and her child again. We think of parenting as a pure environmental factor. 
But it doesn't have differences among women that affect the way they interact with their baby. Some women are just more nurturant or sociable or warm and loving. Some are more controlling. Whereas uh, the second way in which genetics can enter is in the baby. Babies certainly differ in their cuddliness, for example, very early in life, or as Jerry Kagan was talking about. In terms of the infant, we talk about three types of genotype environment correlation. The first is called passive, where the child passively inherits genetics that are correlated with the environment. So if there's genetic influence on sociability, you'd expect that mother we just saw to be more warm and cuddly and smiling with the baby, as well as giving that genes and environment that are correlated with the development of that trait, sociability. But it's sort of passive. The child isn't doing anything about it. It just passively gets these genes and environment. The second type is called evocative, where it's not just limited to genetically related people. Anybody can react to a child or to you on the basis of your genetic propensities. So if you are a smiley shy or behaviorally inhibited, uh, inhibited, the converse is true. So that your genetic propensity is setting up a correlation with the experiences that you receive in life. And even more profoundly, the third type of genotype environment correlation is called active, and that is that we actively create environments that are correlated with our genetic propensities. If you've ever seen a musically gifted child at two or three, You know, if you take away a piano, or they'll hang out with other kids who are musical, they'll listen to radios. Kids can create environments that are correlated with their genetic propensities. Now, there are two aspects to research on this topic of the nature of nurture. And the first is to ask if genetics actually influences or is correlated with environmental measures. Now, at first, this seems crazy. of books on the shelf in the home. Well, how can that be genetic? I mean, th those books don't have DNA. So how can you find genetic influence on number of books on the shelves in a home? Can you think about that? Well, the answer is, it's not like the weather where we don't have anything to do about it. Books on the shelves don't just get there by themselves. Parents put books on the shelves. And all of our measures of the environment that we use, our parenting measures, measures of social support, life events, classroom experiences, all of them can be subject to genetic influence. So there's been quite a bit of research on that, beginning about 20 years ago with my first student, David Rowe, who studied adolescents' perceptions of their parenting. And so in the twin study, he found that identical twins perceive more similar parenting um, in terms of maternal warmth than do fraternal twins. And that was true of both mothers and fathers, suggesting genetic influence on adolescents' perceptions of their parents' parenting towards them. Well, since then, there have been dozens of studies like this. I've done a study over the last 10 years. non-shared environment and adolescent development. We studied 700 families across America who had not only identical twins and fraternal twins, but other sort of genetically distinct family groupings, like step families with half-siblings and genetically unrelated kids. It just gives you more power in these analyses. And what we found, like everyone else, is that all 
positive behavior or negative behavior about the father's behavior. These are heritabilities. The average heritabilities are about 30, 40 percent, just about as heritable as personality traits. And similarly, if you ask the parents about their parenting towards the children, you get a similar result showing genetic influence, substantial genetic influence on their interactions between parents and children. So it isn't all perceptions. We used a task that's widely used in developmental psychology where you ask parents and their adolescent kids, what problem do you have as a dyad? And you know, there's no end to it. If you have adolescents, you'll know what I mean. You could quickly generate a list of problems that you have with your adolescent kid. So then later on in the two-hour home And then we go away and um, rate the videotape later. And you'd think people would be um, inhibited by the videotape, but you don't see any sign of that. Sometimes we had to go in and break it up. <laughs> but the, the, the neat thing we found is that then you can analyze the parents' behavior to the kids and the kids' behavior to the parent. You get an interesting result that the parents' a child's behavior towards the parent. significantly heritable. Uh, it suggests to me that most of the genetic influence in the parent-child relationship is coming from parents responding to genetic differences in their children rather than creating differences in the children. So there have been a, lots of studies along these lines for peer groups and work environments, social support, life events. Most psychological important on environmental measures and genes are important on outcome measures like kids' development, isn't it possible that genes mediate to some extent the relationship between environmental measures and outcome measures? And so in NEAD, that study I described, we did a lot of analyses of this sort. For example, maternal negativity, whether the mother is hostile and conflicted. adolescence antisocial behavior. To what extent is that correlation mediated genetically? We can answer that question because this study was embedded in a genetically sensitive design. And what we find is that most of that correlation is mediated by genetic factors, about two-thirds of it. There's also environmental mediation to the multivariate genetic model fitting that gives us those results. But there have been quite a few studies now along those lines, and they consistently support that sort of conclusion, not just for family environment and psychopathology, but also outside the family, social support as it's correlated with depression. So the two big questions about nature of nurture and behavioral outcomes? And the answer there is also yes to some extent. So the implication here I think is really uh, profound. If you accept that genetics contributes to our experiences, then it moves you away from this passive view of the environment, the old stimulus response view that the environment's out there modify and even create environments and recreate in memory environments. It's those experiences that are important. And that's, I think, where, that's how genetics works in development. And it's, a, um, I think, a very important direction for research and developmental psychology. At the
So what I've been trying to talk to you about with this topic of nature and nurture is basically what genetic research tells us about the environment. I first tried to convince you that genetics is important because if you don't believe that, then this idea of nature and nurture, you know, uh, doesn't make any sense because there isn't any nature. Well, nature is important, but I think increasingly people accept that. I thought it worked. It largely works in a non-shared way, making two kids in a family different from one another, not similar. And that the other important finding at the interface of, gen of nature and nurture is the nature of nurture, genetic influences on environmental measures. And these are the themes of our large interdisciplinary Research Center, which is quite a mouthful, but it does convey what we're trying to do. It's saying nature-nurture wars are over. Both of them are important, so we need to bring together social, that is environmental, and genetic strategies to help us understand the development of complex behavior. influences on behavioral development. And if you remember one thing as you go from explicit to implicit memory in terms of Eric Kandel's talk, if you remember one thing about the, the talk today, it's that the conjunction between nature and nurture is and, not versus. So we're talking about nature and nurture. Thank you.